Greetings friends and welcome to Sovereign Grace Doctrine. We continue with a series of messages on the Trinity of God, the three that are one. And yes, we are still talking about the Holy Spirit of God. My friends, it is my desire, my goal in this extensive series of messages overall to show God's people from the scriptures the distinctions of the three persons of the Godhead set before us in the Word of God. And we here continuing on looking at the Holy Spirit and all that the scriptures speak of regarding the Holy Spirit of God and what we should know and understand about it. And then we will go on to the Son of God and then after that God the Father. Now again, we invite your attention to 1 John chapter 5, where it says there, beginning again here in verse 1, where he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begot, loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit of God, or I mean, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. These three are one. That is the Holy Trinity. Holy, holy, holy is what the angels cried. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, the Word of God, the Father. These three are one. They are one God with three persons, three uh, distinct persons in the Godhead that we set before you here. And we continue to consider from the scriptures what they have to tell us of the Holy Spirit of God. Now we finished up last time there in Romans chapter 15. We move from there now to the book of First, uh, of First Corinthians and chapter 2 where it says, starting in verse 9, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. My friends, it is that Spirit of God, that Holy Spirit of God, that reveals unto us the things of God, the mysteries even, that are contained herein in the Word of God. It is the Spirit of God that gives us understanding. It's the Spirit of God, as we know, that quickens and makes us alive. It is the Spirit of God that leads us unto all truth. It's the Spirit of God, my friends, that dwells within us. It's never apart from us. After we're saved, that Holy Spirit takes up abode within us and is with us from there on in. And it is that Holy Spirit of God that when we sin and we rebel against God, that we quench that Holy Spirit. We lessen its effects. We we're kind of we push it we're pushing it aside and saying oh I'm going to do what I want and not listen to the spiritual instructions of God's Holy Spirit that would lead us unto all truth and show us that hey the way you're living the way you continue to try to move forward in is has still things that are against God still things that according to God's word are sin, and he'd have us to repent and turn from those things. That's the process of sanctification. As long as we live in this life as children of God, we're going to be in a process of sanctification. 
That means being more, being conformed more under the image of Jesus Christ, that we be made more Christ-like. And my friends, if we yield ourselves to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the teaching of the Holy Spirit, we'll find that we will grow more therein, we'll be more Christ-like, we'll be blessed more, and God will prosper us. <clears throat> and God will help us to be the example that we need to be to those around about us, that they might see Christ in us. <clears throat> the deep things of God, those things and people, they're caused to believe by the world and Satan, that, oh, it's, the Word of God is just so hard to comprehend, hard to understand, that you, you, do, you need to cast what you have aside and go out here and find you a Bible that's written more simplistic, it's written more easy to read and understand. My friends, this is a deception of Satan. It don't matter how they write it. If God does not open your eyes to it and show you what's right before you, that you could read and say, oh, if only that were true. And I know of people that have done that. They've read statements in scriptures and said, oh, if only that were true. Well, there it is right before you in the Word of God. Why can you, and like that Ethiopian, when he read from the scriptures that Simon Peter went down to meet, when he read from the scriptures, why could he not understand these things? Simon Peter said, need someone to interpret. When you're lost, you need someone to preach it to you. You need someone to preach to you the gospel and to tell you the gospel of Jesus Christ. How that he suffered and bled and died and took upon himself your sins. He bore them on the cross of Calvary. He took your place therein in death and suffering and agony. Taking the wrath of God and suffering the wrath of God in your place and mine. And all those who believe, we can say without a doubt, he took our place. You that want to stand there in doubt and insurance, there's no assurance to you as long as you remain in doubt and don't believe upon him. All you have to do is believe upon him and you have the assurance set before you in the word of God that he suffered and died for you there. As long as a person remains in unbelief, they're without hope. They're without assurance. You must believe and trust in him. And from that point on, the Holy Spirit is the one who quickens you and makes you alive unto God and begins to show and teach you the things of God. All those things you look at, even then, there are things that you know, we're always going to be learning and growing herein from God's Word. We'll never know it all in this life. And I'd say after 10,000, thousand years in heaven, we'll still be learning of God, my friends, and how glorious He is and how... Uh, just all there is to know of God, it will be beyond our comprehension even in those days as we will continue to learn and be at the feet of Jesus, learning of Him, learning of God in those days. Now, moving on down, uh, going on to chapter, uh, same uh, chapter, and uh, same book and chapter here, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11 says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man, which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we receive not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given of God, or are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual with spiritual things. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. My friends, when we're lost and undone in our sins, without God or his Son, we are in a state of spiritual discernment, a uh, state of a foolish mind where we look upon the things of God as, oh, that's foolishness. Uh, some say, well, they look upon it as, oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, you want to believe that someone died for you and uh, as by their death, burial, and resurrection, you're going to be saved and you're going to go on to heaven. Oh, it's just ridiculous. And uh, you want to trust that old King James Bible? That's ridiculous. And I say it, my friends, let me say to you, yes, to the lost, undone sinner, that's the viewpoint that he has of it. It's just foolishness unto him. It's ridiculous unto him that uh, people believe such things. But my friends, once you're set free from that uh, 
old selfish nature of trusting in yourself and pleasing self, and you're able to uh, lean upon the grace of God and trust in Him for all things, especially your salvation, then it's no longer foolishness. It's a beacon of light. It's wisdom and understanding and gives a peace that passeth understanding, all understanding, even according to scriptures. There's a peace in the heart and mind that passeth understanding because of the assurance that God gives unto us in and through his word of his Son and what he hath done for us, a Holy Spirit of God teaching us and showing us these things, these things of God. And it is God through his Holy Spirit that helps us to compare Scripture to Scripture and leads us unto the truth, all truth even. And my friends, if you will not submit yourself unto the leadership of God, See, he, ha he, he, is, he becomes your Savior. But he must also be the Lord of your life. And if you, in a stubborn, stiff-necked condition, say, oh, I'll accept him as Savior, but I will not let him be Lord of my life, let me say to you, you're still lost and undone in your sins. Because he must be your Savior and your Lord. You must, by acknowledging him and accepting him and believing upon him you're also accepting the fact that he is lord of lords king of kings which makes him your lord and that if we confess him as our lord if we confess him as who he is then we bring glory and honor unto him and if we confess him before men we have the assurance he'll confess us before the father but if we refuse to confess him before men and declare him as our lord and our savior then you're yet in your sins and you're lost. And that's, oh, but I believe upon Jesus. I believe upon that Jesus. I say to you that the demons and the devils believe in him also, and they fear and they tremble because they know he is Lord over them and that he is the one who's going to pass judgment upon them. And my friends, he will pass judgment upon all of us. So I thought we were saved. Being saved does not change the fact that we're going to stand before him one day at that throne of judgment and he will say unto us, well, you've done this unto me. And we'll say, Lord, when did we do that unto you? And you say, in so much as you've done it unto the least of these, my little ones, the least of these that are mine, you've done it unto me. And thereby we brought glory and honor unto God because we help people in time of need. We have compassion on people in time of need. We did what we could by the grace of God to help others and lead them to Jesus Christ. And the same to you wicked that are wicked and ungodly, you that refuse to repent and turn to God, you're going to stand before God, that great white throne judgment, and he's going to say, because you've done it unto the least of these that are mine. So, oh Lord, when did we do that? When you refuse to go and help those who are in need, when you refuse to have compassion on those that are in need, when you refuse to have love toward your fellow man, you, as though you've done it unto the Lord himself, and you have. My friends, all those in history, even those today in our modern times that are persecuting and killing Christians, the blood of the saints is on their hands. And when they stand before God, the charge against them will be, you murdered the, the Son of God. You killed the Son of God. So, oh, when do we do that? Every time they murdered, or martyred as the term is used most often, every time they martyred, murdered, killed a believer in the Son of God, in the true way of the Word of God, a true child of God, Every time they've done that, they've murdered the Lord. And that blood is laid to their account. At least they repent and turn from their wickedness and acknowledge God as the Lord of their life and Savior, then they will be judged for all their sin, all the things which they've done. That's a part of the deep things of God which God reveals unto us. My friends, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Some people, they want to just focus on the love of God. Oh, God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. God is also going to judge you. And if you repent not and turn not from your sinful ways and follow the Lord and keep His commandments, you'll find yourself suffering loss for those things. And perhaps even you'll find yourself cast into the lake of fire itself because 
you do not truly believe on him as Lord and Savior. There are those that have a head knowledge. They believe in the literal existence of that man who is known as Jesus Christ. Uh, they believe well, the scripture says he was the Son of God, so I believe it says he was the Son of God. But do you believe in your heart? Do you believe it from the heart that he is the Son of God who died to save you, a lost sinner, from all your sins? And are you trusting in him today? And my friend, if you're not trusting in the Lord for your salvation, then you're going to die and go to hell. So I'll believe this. When, you know, when I'm ready, I'll do it. You know not today whether or not you'll live to the end of the day, the day your soul may be required of you, and once you get to that point, it's too late. There's no assurance in a deathbed confession. There's no comfort in a deathbed confession. For is there true sincerity there? Or is it just a, a desperate plea at the last moment that, oh God, uh, if you're there, have mercy upon me. But it is that Holy Spirit of God that does reveal these things unto us, the spiritual things, not the, the things of man, the things of the flesh, things of this world are all worldly, all carnal. But the things of God are all spiritual, and it is the Holy Spirit that teaches us and shows us these things. But again, that natural man receives not the things of the Spirit, the spiritual things. The natural man needs to be saved. Needs to be quickened and made alive. That he can trust in the God of salvation. For salvation is of the Lord. And it is only by the name of Jesus whereby we must be saved. In him only can we believe and trust. He is the only way. No other way is given but only through him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and starting at verse 16 we read it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. My friends, we see here that one of the things the Spirit of God teaches his people, teaches the children of God, is that this body that I have, the scripture says, is the temple of God. The God God dwells in the body of my flesh. We think of the we take a moment to think about the Old Testament temples. They had that tabernacle in the wilderness. The Spirit of God came down and dwelt in it. Then they had Solomon's temple. The Spirit of God came and dwelt in it. Then they had the second temple. The Spirit of God came and dwelt in those temples that were made with the hands of man, even though God cannot be contained therein. Neither can he truly be contained within us. But in those days, it was the only place you could go worship God was at the temple. Whether it was a tabernacle or one of those two temples that were built, that one place was the only place where one could acceptably worship the true and living God. So how is it today then? Today... There, and it goes back to that very moment in time there on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit of God came and there they were all in that upper room and all of them, my friends, men and women uh, that were saved, regardless, young or old, if they were truly saved and a part of that number that was lauded somewhere around 120 some odd names, 120 some odd souls, but to all of them, the Holy Spirit of God filled them up. Now, the Holy Spirit of God was already in them. They were saved. To be quickened and made alive means the Holy Spirit's within you. But on that day, when it came down, it filled them up overflowing, and it rested upon them and the, as uh, tongues of uh, cloven tongues of fire were upon their shoulders. And the Holy Spirit of God filling them and over, you know, it's like a cup. Or a glass. They use the image of a glass of water. And once you get it wet inside, it's got water in it. it may not be a lot, but you you got you uh, rinsed it out. You filled it up with water, rinsed it out, and it's got water in it still yet. It's still wet. It was dry beforehand, and now it's wet. 
that's that dry glass is a lost undone person and in that glass that has the water in it even though just it's wet not filled up maybe just has a little bit or has you know uh, less than full it is saved that person's saved the holy spirit of god's within them they're wet and it's not by the outward means of baptism either but by the inward washing there are those that clean up the outside of a person they get them to change their life and change the way they're living change the way they dress and uh, they've convinced them because all oh, you said the prayer you repeated after me and you said the prayer oh you're saved now and they get them to clean up the outside but inward they're still full of dead men's bones because they're they're not truly quickened and made alive unto god and they're not truly saved yet but that glass it's wet on the inside and that's how you are when you're saved the holy spirit of god's in you maybe it's just, but it's you're not overflowing you're not full but on that day of Pentecost, their glass was filled to overflowing. Their bodies were filled to overflowing. Insomuch that they could speak, and everyone heard them in their own language. They didn't speak it, uh, you know, so there's 15 nations there. They didn't speak it 15 times in 15 different languages. They said it once, and everybody heard it in their language. That's a working and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And all those miracles and gifts were given, and the bodies of the believers became the temple where the Spirit of God would dwell, and it dwells within us, and keeps us, preserves us, leads us, guides us. It's always there within us, leading and guiding us into all truth by the Word of God, and for those first hundred years or so, those apostles and a few others had gifts given unto them. And that Holy Spirit, we'll get into that more too as we go on into this in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, I believe here. But those gifts which were given because the Holy Spirit dwelt within the bodies of those believers. The, the faith itself is a gift. The gift of faith, the gift of life. There are many gifts which are still with us, but those gifts of power, the gifts of healing ability, lay your hands on someone and heal someone, that's gone. We don't have that anymore. Uh, there's no more prophecy to be given. Well, we have the complete word of God. And there's no new prophecies, and the prophecy is a pro prophecy of things to come, like the prophecies of the prophets in the Old Testament, where they prophesied the coming of a Messiah. Uh, they prophesied the fall of, the, of Jerusalem and the coming wrath of God. All the prophecies have been given to us. We only preach what we are given now. We have no new prophecies. There, and there was a word of knowledge that they would have in those days. They have a word of knowledge that said, well, something's going to happen. So there's going to be a drought. and There's going to be a famine in the land. These things, too, have ceased. We no longer need them. Bible says those tongues which they had, and they had tongues where one could stand up and speak in a tongue that was not known to him normally, but someone in the congregation would know it and be able to interpret. And if there wasn't someone who could interpret the tongue, the language being spoken, then that person was to sit down and shut up and not speak. That's the rules, guidelines that are set, that are set forth in Corinthians. That uh, mumbo-jumbo which they get up and speak whatever language it was, and it would be, and it's not a, a, a language of angels. It's not a language of God. It's a language of someone who is there, who is of another nation, another country, another tribe, and he stands up and speaks the gospel and declares unto them the the gospel of Jesus Christ, Him crucified, in that language. That person could say, "Well, he's speaking in my language, the gospel of the only begotten Son of God." And that would glorify God. But if there was not someone to interpret, we find, and well, you can find the scriptures where it said that they were not to speak. The Bible tells us that those tongues would cease. And they have. Oh, there are still those today that want to hold on to miracles, and that one in particular. Uh, we, they want to have tongues, and we say, well, that's an evidence of your salvation. That alone is not enough to prove your salvation. And it's not necessary to prove your salvation. 
Salvation is by grace through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. The only begotten Son of God. Nothing added, nothing taken away. Any other gifts you're given, if you have, uh, God gives you the gift to sing, and we can sing perfectly, and you can lead singing, that's great. God gives you the gift of teaching, that's great. God gives you the gift to be able to stand before people and preach, not just teach, but to preach unto them the Word of God. That's the gift of God. Now abideth faith, hope, and charity. These are the three things that are given unto all. Faith, hope, and charity. That's love. Charity's love. Because, why? Because that which is perfect is come. And my friends, I hold it right here in my hands. It's the Word of God. This is able to lead us into all things that God would have us to believe and observe and to keep while we wait and watch for His appearing, for His return. And it is that Holy Spirit of God that leads us and guides us unto all truth herein. We have a gathering of people called his church, his ecclesia, that local visible assembly of baptized believers. And we have visitors that come in the midst of the assembly, and some come often. Eventually some come to the knowledge of the truth, and they repent and believe the gospel. And then they're baptized, and they become members of a true visible body of believers, a local visible church of which there are many. And there are many set forth in the scriptures. But it is that Holy Spirit of God that leads us unto the truth and understanding and the knowledge of what a true church is. Not the church as the world speaks of it, but the church system. The type of church system which Jesus built and established during the days of his ministry. It continues on. It's not this worldly church that so many are devoted to and they're blindly led astray. Buy it and you will fall into the ditch. You'll fall into the judgment of God because you've turned not from these errors and believed the truth. Now, my friends, we find ourselves quickly running out of time here again. But God, in through His Spirit, which dwells in us as a temple of God, this old flesh, we've been bought with a price. Because we're saved and we've been bought with a price, my friends, let me tell you, you're not free to do as you please. You're not free to continue on in sin because if you truly are a child of God and you continue to sin, you're, you're, cha you're quick, uh, uh, not quickening, it's, uh, you're chastening, you're, you're, you're hindering the work of the Holy Spirit within you. The Bible says that if you're truly a child of God, that He'll chasten you like you chasing your child, you'll speak to your child, say, no, don't do that. And you'll tell them again, don't do that. And then eventually you might give them a smack on the rear end, and you'll say, don't do that. And eventually you'll give them more smacks on the rear end if you love them. So, oh, that's abuse, that's abuse, that's child abuse. I'm going to say, too, that's love. It's not love to let a child continue on doing something that could hurt them or hurt someone else. It's just not. My friends, that's the working of the Holy Spirit that chastens us, it quickens us, it makes us alive, and it chastens us, it reproves and rebukes us when we get out of the will of God, do that which is according to the flesh, trying to please ourselves rather than please God. My friends, we are out of time again, and I pray God will keep you and lead you into all truth, and may God be with you, my friends, until we meet again. Be looking up, friends, he's coming back. May God bless you.